here. Uh, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here this afternoon for our coronavirus update. Uh, I'm being joined today by Heath Bode of the Nebraska Healthcare Association and Todd Steubendike from the AARP, and they'll be talking in a few minutes. Uh, just to bring you an update on some of the things that we've got going on here in the state. Uh, first of all, we have issued uh, two new DHMs, one for the Panhandle Public Health District, which includes 12 counties. That we did last night, and that um, uh, DHM will, that directed health measure will last till May 11th. We did another one today that will be for the South Heartland. That will be four counties, including uh, Webster, Adams, Knuckles, and Clay County. And that will also go through May 12th. And just a reminder, when we do these directed health measures, these are more restrictive than the general statewide one. So we are looking at, for example, restaurants closing to dine in. We're looking that bars have to be closed. They can do package takeout or delivery. Same thing for restaurants. We, they can do takeout, carry out, delivery, but no dine in. Uh, we also prohibit selective surgeries and a, a variety of other things that go into that as well. So those are two new DHMs. That brings the total number that we have here in our state up to 34 counties. Um, as of a little bit ago, we have 172 cases that have tested positive here in the state of Nebraska, uh, 3,111 tests. So that's about a 5.6%, I think. Isn't that about 5.6%? It's 5.3, 5.6 in that area. 5.3. 5.3. Thank you, Dr. Antone. So 5.3% of the cases that we are testing, and remember, these are the, the high-risk cases. These are people who have either been traveling or they've been associated with somebody who we know to have the coronavirus, or they presented to a hospital uh, with uh, you know severe symptoms and so forth. These folks are the high-risk cases. We're still testing about 5.3%. And to put that in perspective, when we were on the phone call yesterday with the mayor of Washington, D.C., she is testing at about a 12% rate with her high-risk cases, or just in general of their cases. So uh, just to put in kind of perspective of where we are here in the state of Nebraska. This is all a great reminder to tell people to continue to pay attention to that social distancing that we need people to make sure, again, if you are displaying those symptoms of high fever, cough, shortness of breath, stay home immediately. And especially if you're in one of our DHM areas, everybody in your household needs to stay home as well. Contact your health care provider. Do not just go into an emergency room. Call and make an appointment. Do not just go into a doctor's office. Call and make an appointment. And they will make sure that they keep you isolated until you can be tested to make sure you don't have regular flu or something like that. And again, if you fall into one of those high-risk categories, we will then get you tested uh, appropriately as well for that. So that's a, that's a big reminder, and again, everybody, keep that six-foot distance from everybody. Make sure that you're washing your hands often, 20 seconds at a time, coughing into your elbow or into a tissue, throw the tissue away, all the sorts of good public hygiene things we want people to do. And this includes, as I reminded everybody yesterday, when you're out in a park or something like that, please, Keep the gatherings to 10 people or less. Make sure you're keeping six foot distance from each other, even when you're outside. Same thing at the big box stores. Uh, I know, for example, Costco really is kind of the model for this. Uh, they've learned a lot, and so they have spaced out people six feet apart. They've got people making sure they don't gather in too big of groups. Everybody needs to be doing that as well. Make sure you're practicing that good social distancing. So we got uh, two new DHMs we're talking about. I am also in the process of getting an executive order out that will waive regulations with regard to our health care facilities. So some of the things this will do, for example, is waive some of the restrictions on our critical access hospitals with regard to the number of beds they have and the time limits they have. Uh, same thing with regard to uh, amb uh, ambulatory surgical clinics. Uh, generally, they have a time limit on how long they can keep people. We're waiving those time limits. This will also allow hospitals, for example, to have more flexibility with the kinds of beds they can add on, so that will waive some of the restrictions there. We're waiving some of the certifications with regard to nurse aides, medication aides, and dining assistants, so that, again, if, as long as they're competent to perform their duties, that they will be, there'll be more flexibility there to be able to be hired or be brought in to be able to help with staffing in our healthcare facilities. So those are part of the executive order that we've also got out there. So again, basically giving healthcare facilities more flexibility with regard to the types of patients they bring in, the types of beds they have, allowing that to expand, and really making it so that we can increase that hospital capacity here in our state to be able to accommodate 
the people who will need our care, uh, those older Nebraskans, people with underlying health care conditions, to be able to make sure we can accommodate those in our health care facilities. So that's really what this is all about, all the social distancing, all the thing we're doing about uh, health care capacity. It's about making sure we have the ability to take care of people who are going to be severely impacted by the coronavirus and that we can take care of them in our health care facilities. So this is why we need everybody's continued compliance on this. So far here in Nebraska, uh, we know that we have not been impacted by it like other states have, but we cannot loosen our vigilance. We need to continue to remain vigilant with regard to these social distancing guidelines and to make sure that, again, that 10-person rule, which the president extended through the end of April, we are doing that as well. So everybody needs to continue to pay attention to those sort of things, use common sense and good judgment, all that sort of thing. So please continue to do that. Uh, next, we also put out our guidance with regard to nursing facilities and how they should be preparing for the coronavirus with regard to thinking about their staff and people not being available about, uh, obviously, most of the nursing facilities, and I think you're talking about this, have already limited visitations to really end-of-life things already in general. Uh, but that's part of our guidance to, to limit those interactions. Uh, part of our guidance will also involve wearing surgical masks for all the people who are working in those healthcare facilities. And then if you have a patient who is uh, COVID-19 uh, positive, make sure they're wearing a surgical mask as well. Surgical masks have been shown, um, at least talking to folks in the industry, uh, that has helped reduce the spread of the virus. So when we want all of our workers and nursing home facilities to be able to use a surgical mask if they have those available. One of the things we're doing at the state, again, is to try to purchase more of these things to be able to distribute out to our local public health departments and then get those out to the folks who need those surgical masks. So we are trying to acquire more of those at the state. But to the extent that folks have those, and again, you can wear, wear that surgical mask all day long if you need to, as long as you don't like sneeze into it or something like that. As long as you don't uh, do something like that, you can wear that surgical mask all day long. It is fine. It will continue to help protect you and help protect the residents of that nursing home. So again, that's one of our guidelines we want everybody uh, with regard to our nursing homes to be looking to. All those guidelines will be out there on our website. So dhhs.ne.gov slash coronavirus. You can find all those there. So please go check that out. Uh, so that's uh, kind of the big things that we've got going on with regard to today. Our DHMs that we have issued, that we um, have a new executive order with regard to the uh, uh, health care facilities, and then, of course, our guidance to nursing care facilities specifically. And I'm going to bring up our speakers to talk about that, and then I'll follow up with some additional things uh, uh, that, are, that we want to just get back and talk about as well. But again, I want to remind people, continue to do the social distancing. That is so important to slowing down the spread of the virus. You know, as we expand testing, we are going to expect to see more cases. That's nothing to be alarmed by. Uh, but we want to remind everybody, please make sure that you're doing all you can to prevent this virus. Everybody in the state, every Nebraskan can be a part of the solution to slow down this virus here in Nebraska. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and bring up Heath Bode from the Nebraska uh, Healthcare Association, and then I'll just go ahead and let you introduce Todd, and then we'll give Todd a chance to talk. Does that sound fair? Great. All right, Heath, you're up. Governor Ricketts, thank you for inviting me today for this opportunity. As the governor said, I am Heath Bode. I have the privilege of leading the team at the Nebraska Healthcare Association. And a few points I thought I might share with you today that our nursing facility, assisted living, home health, and hospice members are in a war with this virus. And I'll tell you a few things about why I use the word war, but I use it on purpose. Uh, I just want to start out by uh, telling Governor Ricketts, thank you so much uh, for, for your efforts, for your team's efforts. Uh, I spend a tremendous amount of time connected with Dr. Antone and other members of the governor's team. And I have to say, uh, the, the collaboration and the communication exchange, the ability to search out solutions has been absolutely fantastic. Each day when I watch the governor's press conference at 2 o'clock, he starts out by telling us like he did today, as Nebraskans, we need to do the right thing by socially uh, getting, getting our social distance from each other. And I would just tell you, when we're talking about our providers that are out in the community, maybe in someone's home, that's super important. When we're talking about a provider that works in congregate living, like a nursing facility or assisted living, the consequences for not doing proper protocols uh, are dire. And there's examples of that across the country. As of yesterday afternoon, we know that four long-term care facilities in the state have had COVID-positive um, uh, customers in their facilities. 
And I would tell you that while we support those members and help them work through uh, contacting their local health department when there is a COVID positive test, we're really focusing at the association on a couple of key points. Uh, one would be around supplies. As the governor's talking today uh, about guidance that uh, team members in a long-term care facility need to be wearing a, ma a surgical mask at all times. One of the things that we've heard when the governors joined with the providers across the state each Friday is that that's been in shortage. And so real, uh, trying to work through the supplies, when's the proper time to use them? And then on the workforce shortage, and I couldn't be more pleased uh, to hear the governor's thoughts today and his, emergency, uh, his executive order to uh, make more flexible the requirements with direct caregivers, with medication aids, and with, um, with dining assistance. It will allow us to train bedside caregivers, as an example, in a much quicker time frame, which will be so much more important as this uh, virus continues to run its path in Nebraska. So this guidance today uh, on a workforce perspective and the guidance uh, that the governor's referring to from uh, the, the proper health precautions is much appreciated. You know this information changes daily. I just want to tell you quickly a thing that's remained constant uh, in this world. Uh, the, thing, the, the passion and the enrichment that the team members in long-term care facilities have developed and enhanced uh, with those elders that they're caring for. I've seen great examples, maybe you have too, about uh, using virtual options, iPads and uh, Zoom connections and ways to connect families and loved ones because nobody thinks this is an optimal uh, thing that we're doing with social distancing. Uh, I, I would tell you that I think at times the word hero can get overused. But I have to tell you, there's a lot of reflections I have right now about healthcare workers in this environment, staying there, being dedicated, doing the right thing, uh, and that notion of hero follows through for me. I'm, I'm inspired by their dedication. Uh, Governor, thank you again. I would introduce Todd Stubendick from the uh, AARP of Nebraska. Thank you, Governor Ricketts. Thank you, Heath, appreciate it. My name is Todd Stubendick. I'm the state director of AARP Nebraska. I'm honored to be here representing the 200,050 plus Nebraskans who are members of AARP. AARP has been working to promote the health and well being of older Americans for more than 60 years. In the face of COVID 19, AARP is providing information and resources to help older people and those caring for them to protect themselves from the virus. You can find more information at www.aarp.org slash coronavirus. I'd like to thank the governor for his leadership. And I think all Nebraskans can be proud of the bipartisan response the governor and the state legislature have had to this crisis. Let me make three quick points today. First, older adults are particularly vulnerable to the coronavirus. While the elderly are the most vulnerable, each of us has a responsibility to help slow the spread of this virus by following our state and local social distancing guidance. Stay at home, flatten the curve, and reduce the risk of spreading this disease to our vulnerable populations. Second, let me say a word to the people who are traveling to Nebraska. This includes our many snowbirds who are returning now that the signs of spring are, are showing up. If you've been traveling outside of the state of Nebraska in a place where there is, a, there is coronavirus, please listen to the CDC guidance. When you return home, self-quarantine, monitor your health, and avoid contact with others for at least 14 days. Finally, I think we all need to take a moment and help take care of each other during this crisis as well. Think about reaching out to an older friend or relative and checking in on them. Ask them if they need something. Offer to run an errand for them so they don't have to leave their homes. For people looking for a way to help, please go to aarpcommunityconnections.org. At this site, you'll find mutual aid groups or you will have the option of starting your own. And just to explain, mutual aid groups are informal groups of volunteers who band together to find effective ways to support those people most in need. Again, thank you, Governor Ricketts, uh, for inviting AARP to be here today, and thank you for your leadership. Great. Thank you very much, Todd. And thank you very much for highlighting a couple of those important points with regard to our snowbirds that are coming back here to the state, that they are part of that group that needs to quarantine for 14 days to make sure, as all travelers who are coming here that are not transitory, you know, our, our transportation workers are exempt from that, but everybody else that's coming in needs to, to take that 14 days. So thank you very much for highlighting that. And then also just the opportunity for all of us during this emergency to be able to reach out to members of our community and ask them if they need help. So if you've got folks in your apartment building, for example, that you know are older, ask them if they need help. You know, shoot them a text, see if they need anything. If you're in a parish, be working with your congregation to find out if there's members of your congregation who need that extra help. Again, our older folks, especially those with underlying health conditions, aren't most at risk. 
And so we want them to be able to stay home. They may need something. They may need an errand run. They may need some food picked up, some, some sort of supply. It's an opportunity for all of us to take this opportunity to reach out to our fellow Nebraskans, our neighbors, our friends, our family, and see who needs help. So thank you very much, Todd, for that important message. Uh, also, just along those lines, uh, through our Department of Transportation, our signs that we put up, you know, those amber alert signs that we have across the interstates and so forth, those are all reflecting that message now with regard to if you're coming back to the state after having traveled, you need to do that quarantine. Again, this doesn't apply to transportation workers, truckers, railroaders, and so forth. But it does apply if you have been in someplace else in the country, if you're that snowbird, what have you, if you're coming back, you're expected to quarantine for 14 days. So please take that advice, be a part of the solution of how we flatten the curve, as Todd was saying. Uh, also, just along the lines of the Department of Transportation, we've been getting questions with regard to road traffic. Uh, we do have road traffic has been down about 29%, uh, mostly in passenger vehicles. Truck traffic actually has been pretty stable, just down a little bit, but it's mostly that uh, passenger traffic that is down about 29%, and that's been statewide. So we have been seeing you know, the people who are reducing their travel, staying at home. It is showing up in the numbers that we have from the Department of Transportation with regard to road traffic. Uh, I thank you for your, Heath, your comments with regard to acknowledging our health care workers and what heroes they have been so far through this emergency and will continue to be as we look ahead to April when we know it's going to be a tough month. Uh, we expect that if the models from the federal government are correct, mid to late April will be the peak here in Nebraska. So it's going to be a tough month here in Nebraska. We are going to expect to see more cases and so forth, but it will be our health care workers who are going to be the front line. So appreciate acknowledging all the great work they're going to do. They are, have already been very flexible with regard to this. I know that we've got a lot of people working very hard, and we want to acknowledge the work they're doing. Uh, it is also National Social Worker Month as well, and so we want to thank our social workers who will also be a part of combating this pandemic and thank them for their great work. We had a question yesterday with regard to uh, bir uh, having a birth in Omaha and whether or not uh, a birth assistant was going to be allowed and uh, you know that partner is going to be allowed in that husband or whatever and the answer is yes so in Omaha they are allowing one person to be able to come in for that uh, we've gotten questions from landlords with regard to the executive order I wrote on evictions and I, I really want to uh, first of all say to the renters out there again this is not a prohibition against you getting evicted down the road this is deferment so we're saying during this emergency and we are deferring that the fact that courts don't have to act on this until after May 31st, but it does not get you out of paying rent. It just is an acknowledgement that if you've been impacted by the coronavirus, you've lost your job, you have to stay home with kids because they're out of school, or you're taking home of a, a loved one, or maybe you're quarantined yourself or sick, whatever the reason, if you're impacted by coronavirus, then this is a way to help defer that. But it, again, you're still going to be responsible for paying your rent, but it will be a deferment during this emergency. For the landlords out there, again, what I'd recommend is work with your renters, have good communication going back and forth, try to work out plans, and I think I commented last week, I know there's a, rent or a landlord here in Lincoln that has cut their rent to all their tenants this month, or for the month of April, uh, so that's something that you can take a look at, but also reach out to your banks, work out if you've got loan agreements with them, also as a small business, you're eligible for that SBA loan that's out there, Again, you can go to www.sba.gov slash disaster. There's a new, because we are a disaster state for the Small Business Administration, there's loans out there up to $2 million, 30-year loan, 3.75% interest rates. You will have to have your financials, so you'll still have to talk to your bank to pull all that together. But another option for you to get liquidity during this emergency. So for our uh, renters and our landlords, I've kind of got that advice out there that we've talked about in the past. We also received questions with regard to the CARES Act and what that means for unemployment, specifically here in Nebraska. And again, I think I said this yesterday, but I just want to remind people again. So this is specifically about trying to help out people who are impacted by the coronavirus. People have been laid off through no fault of their own. So yes, there will be increased payments because of the CARES Act. And if you qualify, we encourage everybody to apply for that. And this will cover groups that are not typically covered under unemployment. So there's sections, as we talked about yesterday, will cover people who are self-employed or those nonprofit folks and so forth. But if you have a job, do not quit. Because in Nebraska, if you quit your job, you will not be eligible for these benefits. It's something for people who have been laid off because of the coronavirus, not for somebody who has quit. So I want to make that very clear. 
And if you have been laid off and your employer calls you back to work and you choose not to go back, you will also have deemed to have quit, which means you will no longer be eligible for those benefits. So again, I want people to be making good decisions about this. If you have a job, do not quit. That will not make you eligible. You'll be ineligible for those unemployment benefits. So if you have a job, don't quit. This is about people who are being impacted by coronavirus and are being laid off involuntarily. So just want to make sure we're uh, addressing that specifically. Today is also the day that we are doing our blood drive at the state of Nebraska. I want to thank all the Nebraskans who stepped up after last week's press conference to contact the American Red Cross to donate blood. Uh, I've heard from Wayson Dunn, who was with us last week, that we have seen a great number of increase in people uh, wanting to donate blood to the American Red Cross. We filled up all of our slots for our state teammates today, and so I'm very proud of our teammates and the way they stepped up to be able to help out the American Red Cross and donate this life-saving resource. And in fact, we had so many people volunteer that we are going to do another blood drive on April 3rd to be able to, again, donate more blood and help out our teammates who are uh, willing to donate their blood but couldn't do it today. So again, great response from our state teammates with regard to giving blood. So I really appreciate everybody's great work around that. And then, uh, now, okay, where's Taylor go? All right, Taylor, so I'm ready to get into the uh, questions here. Was there anything else I was supposed to hit before I got into our questions that were emailed in? Oh, thank you very much. So uh, Taylor reminded me about another executive order that I signed had to do with turkey hunting permits. So we issued turkey per hunting permits to people who are out of state. I signed an executive order working with, together with Game and Parks so that those uh, we will no longer issue permits to out of state people to come turkey hunt here in Nebraska. Uh, we've got the best turkey hunting state in the country. I think you all know that. I proclaim it every year. Nobody's ever said that I'm wrong. But uh, this year is not the year that we're going to be promoting that outside the state. So Game of Parks will work with those out-of-state folks that have already purchased a turkey hunting permit to issue them a refund, and we will no longer be issuing permits to out-of-state folks. Again, it just makes sense if we're asking people to come here and quarantine for 14 days, it just doesn't make sense that they're going to come here and quarantine for 14 days and then go turkey hunting. Uh, we want to uh, just really kind of nip that in the bud. So. We're not going to be issuing those out-of-state permits. And then also, I want to remind all hunters, again, even when you're out there in the blind, make sure you're continuing to practice good social distancing. You're probably, if you go hunting with somebody, you got to stay six feet away, all that sort of stuff. We want to continue to make sure that we're practicing good social distancing and all the other things that will help slow the spread of the virus. This is one of the things we'll, that will do it. Obviously, in-state residents will be able to get turkey hunting permits, and so um, we expect to you know, still have a Nebraska residents have access to that. And so with that, I'm going to go ahead and get into the questions. So Andrew Lacey of KBRY asks, with community spread now confirmed on both ends of the state, what, at what point does the current patchwork approach need to give way to a more proactive statewide approach before people are infected rather than after? Uh, before people are infected rather than after? Okay. With uh, only a fraction of the people who have symptoms able to be tested, especially outside the Lincoln and Omaha area, it is, not uh, is it not reasonable to assume that the virus has already reached most of the state and act accordingly? So again, uh, Andrew, so we've got a plan that we put together beginning of this month with the experts at UNMC who are world-recognized experts in infectious diseases. Part of what that plan recognizes is that the virus will actually not spread at the same rate across our state. It will be in some places sooner and other places later. And that's what our plan really recognizes, that what we're doing is a regional approach based on public health department to be able to issue those directed health measures when we have those cases of community spread. And again, community spread is defined as people who we can't figure out how they got the virus, can't trace how they got it. You know, if they tra travel related, we understand that doesn't count, uh, but for those folks that we can't figure out how they got it, that's what we're using our benchmark in those public health districts to say the virus has reached the point where we need that directed health measure. So rather than the way you framed it, which is a patchwork approach, what this is is a regional approach that recognizes that it will, as uh, Dr. Lauer used the term, a be asynchronously spread across our state. It won't be spread at the same time. And so We'll take these directed health measures as we need them. And in each place, you know, we've put them in for roughly six weeks. So where we had that community spread in Omaha and we have the 
directed health measure going to April 30th. Now in the panhandle, it's going to May 11th. So you can see because they were, we, we reached that threshold later, theirs is gonna go a little bit later as well. So this really is a tailored approach on, based on region across our state. Not every part of the state is gonna be in, uh, impacted the same way at the same time. And what we really wanna do is make sure that we catch it in time, but also not to go too early. Because if we go too early, what happens is people may get tired, they may stop paying attention to the things we're asking them to do with regard to the washing your hands and the six feet social distance, physical distance, you know, that sort of thing, the, the limiting groups to 10 people. We, we want people to make sure they're paying attention to all those things as the virus is starting to surge in their communities because if they get tired and stop doing it, that's when we could see it really spike up. So it's important to try and time it for when, uh, time it in each community for when we see the virus starting to spread. And that's why we've taken this in a regional approach. And that's the plan we put together again at the beginning of this month with the world leading experts at UNMC. So we will continue to follow that plan with regard to looking at each public health district. When we have that community spread case, that's when we'll issue a DHM and really tailor it for that region so that we're timing it as best possible as we can to when we think the spread of the virus is there. And then just one other thing with regard to testing in our rural communities. Uh, if somebody is meeting the same criteria that we have, whether it's in Lincoln or Omaha or Scotts Bluff or in Hastings or wherever it is, it's, around, it's really around those high-risk folks that we're testing first, which is, again, if you've got the symptoms of high fever, coughing, shortness of breath, and you're negative for the regular flu symptoms or regular respiratory disease, and you've traveled either domestically or internationally, or you've been associated with somebody who is known to have the coronavirus, those people will be tested whether they're in Scotts Bluff or in Omaha. And in fact, if you look at some of our rural counties like Gosper, Nemaha, Knox, that's how we found those people. So they're being tested along the lines of that criteria. So even if you're in a rural area and you meet those criteria, you will be tested. There's not a lack of testing for those high-risk folks. We will make those a priority to get tested. Now, we will also be looking to expand that testing to healthcare workers and people in nursing homes and nursing, uh, nursing care workers as well. And as we do that, we will look to do that again, find ways to be able to make sure that happens statewide. So stay tuned as we get more down the road of that path and expand more of that capacity, we will be doing that as well. Okay, that was a long-winded answer, probably way more than Andrew was looking for. All right, next we're going to Andrew Osaki from KETV, who, Andrew, you're not here, right? Okay, I don't see him. Uh, last time he cheated and asked questions online and then showed up. Uh, what more can be done to help nursing homes and assisted care facilities stop or mitigate the spread of COVID-19? Timely question, Andrew, but I think we kind of covered that already with regard to the guidance that we put out there, our executive order with regard to uh, loosening the restrictions on nurse aides, medication aides, dining assistance, all that sort of thing will help nursing homes be able to staff up uh, and kind of flex in people as some of maybe their workers are exposed. Uh, the guidelines we put out specifically today around wearing masks and you know, cleaning, doing all the good cleaning and, you know, all the other good hygiene stuff. That guidance is out there at dhh.ne.gov slash coronavirus. So all that guidance is out there. Uh, okay, where are we getting masks and PPE to those workers to protect themselves and their residents? So um, where are we in getting? Oh, okay, so uh, a couple things with regard to PPE. We have been distributed a little over half of what our strategic national stockpile allocation has been from the federal government, and that is being allocated, either it's been allocated or it's being allocated, depending on which shipment it came in, out to the local public health departments to be able to provide those to nursing homes or anybody else who would need that assistance with regard to PPE. Last week, Thursday, we also sent an email out to all of our public health departments to work with their communities on what their needs are gonna be on a monthly basis during peak. So asking them what we th they think their need is gonna be. At the same time, with the bill that was passed last week, we have placed purchase orders to buy more PPE. So we're working to be able to get that. Now some of this PPE is coming from China, and so there are delays in being able to get some of that stuff here. So we are working hard, but we've got orders placed. We're looking to get stocked up on this PPE and then get, distributed out, get, get it distributed out to the, the workers who will need that. Nick Stevenson, WJAG. My question is with all of the directed health measures. Oh, I think this, I should have put.
put this with the um, other one earlier, but with all the uh, directed health measures being implemented for different counties, are there any thoughts of just putting the whole state directed under a directed health measure instead of waiting for more cases? So again, our regional approach really is about tailoring this to each portion of the state and tailoring it to communities so that we can make sure that we're timing it right for that community and get better compliance. Which is, I'm sure, how you wish I had answered uh, that question in the first place. It went a lot faster from Andrew. Yeah, okay. Uh, Grant Schulte, Associated Press. Some restaurant owners in northern Nebraska are worried that the virus will lead to prolonged restrictions on the Rosebud Indian Reservation, which is a huge part, a huge part of the customer base. They're also concerned that the res reservation will become a new hotspot, which might lead to more local cases. Has Governor Ricketts talked with South Dakota officials about this, and is there anything the state could be doing or should be doing? So I have been in contact with uh, Governor Christy Noem. So far on the Rosebud Reservation, under, um, it seems to be in pretty good shape, but of course that is gonna be a concern, and we will continue to monitor it. Obviously we are not going to block healthy individuals from um, you know, normal kind of work type activities. So it is something that we just will need to continue to work with the officials in South Dakota and, and stay in good communication with regard to that. Uh, both concerns are valid concerns, and we'll just continue to stay in touch to, to know what steps are gonna be appropriate. And um, really, again, so far right now, the Rosebud Reservation has not been impacted um, to the extent that maybe other parts of the country have been impacted. Are there any indications that we'll see the, uh, the curve lag in rural areas? Specifically, is it likely that new cases will peak in Omaha and Lincoln before they peak out west? So again, I, again we expect that this virus will be in different parts of the state at different times, and that is what our public health uh, measures are all about. They're regionally based, based on public health district to accommodate the fact that, yes, Omaha will probably be impacted more quickly than maybe Holdridge will be. So our public health measures take that into account as part of how we're rolling those out. Aaron Sanford, Omaha World Herald. Uh, Democrat Party chairs have signed a letter with new demands for elections. Did you guys have any comment about the push? Didn't know if this has or hasn't been discussed between the governor and the secretary of state. Uh, uh, earlier we announced what our plans are for the election. The elections are going forward May 12th. We are encouraging everybody to get that early uh, voting ballot in to make that request. Those are being mailed out to all of our voters in the state. So we have a plan. We're going to continue to follow that plan. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go ahead. Oh, Taylor, do you have anything else that's been texted in? So the question from Paul Hamill at the Omaha World Herald was a former state senator said, when will uh, public or testing be done for residents in rural areas, general public residents? It's being done in Omaha, it's not being done in rural areas. Actually not true. So again, we have a screening process for everybody, whether you're in Omaha or whether you're in one of our rural parts of the state. I just kind of described it, but just again briefly, if you're sick, stay home, you know, got the high fever and cough, contact your healthcare professional, you'll be screened. Go through, make sure it's not influenza A or B or respiratory virus. And if it's not any of those things, and you're high risk because you've traveled domestically or internationally or you've been associated with somebody, if you're in a rural area, you're gonna get tested. If you're in an urban area, you're gonna get tested. Again, this is how we found cases like in Gosper County and Nemaha and so forth. So now, when we're talking about expanding that beyond, we will come up with some plans, and that's why I said just stay tuned with regard to that. When we look at, when we have more capacity, we can start expanding that we will be taking steps to make sure that folks in our rural areas are able to access that too. Paul also wants to know about the Houston XL pipeline, so will workers try to stay in the quarantine? If we're discouraging turkey hunting, how can we justify construction workers? So the question was are, uh, with regard to uh, the folks that are coming into work on the Keystone XL pipeline, and uh, you may have seen the announcement that that is moving forward, and so his question was, what will we do with regard to the workers, with regard to that, and uh, how can we make a distinction between the turkey hunters and the workers? I think there's a really easy distinction there, right? The turkey hunters are coming in for a very short period of time to hunt. In fact, they're generally hunting for fewer days than they would have to quarantine versus the workers who are gonna be here on an extended basis, and I would remind everybody that when we're talking about people traveling into state, we've already exempted workers like transportation workers, like a trucker or something like that who's coming to the state that is not just, you know, 
coming here either because we're returning snowboard or coming uh, bird or coming to visit. So there's a, a big distinction between construction workers who are here doing a job and are on site for a, a job versus somebody who's coming here for recreation. But I think it's a great point that we will need to discuss with TC Energy with regard to the steps to making sure that the folks that are coming here to work on this project are properly screened to make sure that they're not bringing the virus in. So we'll uh, take that in consideration as we get closer to the time when those folks may be coming to our state. George Lobby with the North Platte Coalition wants to know, did the, did the reader contact them asking about closing the camping areas at Lake McConaughey? They're worried about Coloradans perhaps coming to Grove when it gets warmer, and Colorado is having COVID-19 infestation. So the question from uh, George Lobby of the North Platte Telegram was about uh, Campsites like uh, Lake McConaughey, as the season gets warmer, and uh, people from COVID-heavy states like Colorado, are they going to be allowed to come over here, and are we going to close those uh, campgrounds and so forth? I would say that is something, you know, right now I believe Game and Parks has closed those uh, campgrounds right now. Obviously, as we are looking at loosing restrictions, we will take that in consideration before we open up campgrounds that would bring folks in. As you can see uh, right now with our directive, if you are coming from Colorado, you have to quarantine for 14 days. So you can see that we are already taking steps to really make sure that anybody coming to our state is not going to be spreading the virus. We will take the same steps and guidelines with regard to our, our campsites and so forth, like we've done with turkey hunting to discourage people from coming in from out of state and bringing virus for turkey hunts. So, uh, Chris Burback is asking an additional follow-up question with regard to, can you repeat that again, Taylor? So, FOP wants 911 centers to be given information from public health departments. I would suggest go through the regular channels uh, to talk to folks about how something like that might be mechanized and what all the rules and regulations are with regard to that. So, um, you know, again, I, we certainly want to work closely with law enforcement with regard to making sure we're keeping everybody healthy and safe. So I suggest uh, you know work with the local public health departments and make the uh, that uh, request through regular channels. That's what we got. All right, great. Folks in the room, questions, Martha. So the question was, are we asking people from Omaha when they go to other parts of the state to quarantine uh, for fewer cases? I would say, no, we're not doing that, Martha. Again, we're all on the same team here in the state of Nebraska. But I would remind people that part of what we want to do, and when we're talking about these directed health measures, is to avoid unnecessary travel. So really, it should only be essential travel. Um, again, you're supposed to be limiting your interactions to groups of 10 people or less. So unless you have, your job requires you to travel, uh, really, fo really folks around the state ought to be really, any of that non-essential travel, they ought to be curtailing. And that's actually what we see right now, right, with our traffic counts uh, down 29%, and that being primarily with uh, passenger traffic, not the truck traffic. So we're not gonna be um, you know, asking people in Omaha to quarantine, but we certainly say anybody you should really be limiting your kind of voluntary or your, your non-essential travel be, during this emergency. Would that include the turkey hunting? So again, if you're going to go turkey hunting, it depends where you're going. If you're just going to go outside of Omaha into a blind, you're really not going to put a lot of other people uh, at risk. You're not going to be, again, we don't want you to go big groups of turkey hunting, but if you're going out into a blind by yourself, again, that just really isn't the kind of public gathering that is going to be prone to spreading the virus. So again, what we're really trying to focus on is large public groups is what we're trying to limit. 10 people or less is really what we're focused on. Question for Keith Hillary. Keith, you're up. You mentioned that the relaxed restrictions would enable faster training of, of bedside caregivers. Well, what was the old time and what's going to be the new time? And does that also apply to some of the other people that were mentioned, nurse aides, medication aides, that sort of thing? Yeah, thanks for the question. So the question is uh, the, the mention earlier about uh, relaxing the requirements for uh, bedside caregivers 
and what was the old requirement and what might this allow. <clears throat> so specifically in Nebraska for a certified nursing assistant, it was 76 hours of training. And this would require, as an example, a modified approach to that. So one of the things as the association we're working on right now actually have developed is an eight hour, eight contact hour training that would get the basics in play from a competency perspective, get people able to go out and be a part of that care team and then they can continue forward to the 76 hours. Prior to this, you wouldn't have been able to start in the facility on the floor, as an example, prior to the 76 being completed. So it's, it's, it's an opportunity for us to have caregivers uh, prior to that end point, uh, at, at, in this particular case, at 76 hours. And part of that is also that they're competent to provide the service too, right? Absolutely, Governor. Right. Yeah, so the, so the hours are relaxed, but as the Governor points out, uh, our teams across the state, the provider teams, would still need to make sure that individual is competent to provide that care that they're doing. Uh, so I, I believe the relaxation That's, is for nurse aids, aids medication medications, aids, dining assistance, and dining simply. assistance. Okay. And can you give any overall numbers? Uh, you have X thousands of people in these jobs right now. You need Y thousands. Uh, I, I apologize. I don't have a, a total number. I can tell you the last uh, numbers that I saw prior to the outbreak uh, of COVID was that we are uh, already – I, I believe the number was 8% short. I can get that back through the governor's team and, and something like in the next two years, we needed another 19% of direct caregivers. But again, that's all pre-COVID. And the concern and the, and the appreciation I have for the governor's guidance on this and, and his relaxing with his executive order on these workforce requirements has a lot to do with current just being challenged from healthcare providers and team members. But then when we start talking about maybe an outbreak in a community, when we start talking about team members being infected, either self-quarantining or uh, having to be quarantined, uh, th then we're taking the number of available team down, uh, which creates even, it further exa um, exacerbates the issue of being short of team members. I cannot. I, I, as of, I believe, 4 o'clock yesterday, I understood four long-term care facilities had COVID positives. I, I, I'm not uh, – was it – four facilities, yeah. So maybe, maybe that number had some uh, multiple residents or, uh, or uh, team members involved. I'm not sure. I, but from a facility perspective, there's four that I'm aware of. And I don't think that that changed. Dr. Anton, does that still seem accurate? Four facilities. Four facilities. And Dr. Anton, do you know how many people in those four facilities? Off the top of your head? <clears throat> at the Carter House, there are... There's nine at Carter House, right? So plus three other facilities with one person, that would be 12. So that maybe that's... 13 residents at Carter House. I'm sorry, how many? 13. There's 13 residents at Carter House. That were positive? That were positive. Okay. There are four Douglas County. One Just come up here, Dr. Anto. Just go ahead and give the, give the numbers. <laughs> So four facilities, 13 residents have tested positive from the Carter House in Blair, uh, one in Norfolk St. Joe's facility, four in Douglas County, and the fourth one was, uh, what one, hey, Heath, help me out for the fourth Papillion? one. Papillion uh, has had uh, one resident there too. So those are residents, but... And four facilities, that, those number of residents. There were, I, I, I have some written down here for the um, Carter House. I believe there's six healthcare workers that tested positive, two under investigation in Norfolk, and uh, Papillion Manor, I think we're working. Those numbers should come back today. And then Douglas County, I believe those numbers should come back today. Yes, um, yesterday I think I mentioned, uh, the question was is how many people in hospitals right now that are being treated for COVID. Yesterday we had 19 in the hospital and I think that might have gone up uh, two or three today. Why is there a discrepancy in how many tests in the facilities we have or facilities the number of 
the the question is is why we mentioned we have the capability here in Nebraska now to do approximately 800 to 900 tests a day. Uh, I mentioned that on Sunday we had our most number of tests come back around 290, 300. Yesterday it was over 350, so it's going up every day quite a bit. And the reason is we're still using the, the same guidelines that we used, as the governor mentioned, as far as whose criteria for testing. Although the, you're seeing the numbers go up because we are concentrating more on the residents of the long-term care facilities and the workers in those facilities. Yes, they have, yes. So again, first responders are being tested. First responders are also a priority for testing. Is there a fear that if you open up testing to the general public, it turns into why did I get tested because there is a certain number? Or why is, I know you, if there's the decision only to test certain people to make those restrictions, but at the point where you guys know you can start to test the general public, is there that concern? Uh, the question is, is, is there a concern if we just open up testing to the general public without any screening? Could we be overwhelmed? For certain, that would happen. And that's why we're still using some of those screening criteria. If we're loosening or laxing anything as far as those screening criteria go, it's that it's probably not as necessary anymore to get what's called the respiratory pathogen panel, the RPP, and to let the providers or the screeners use their discretion as far as whether that's necessary or not. The question is, is do we have any idea how many people might be COVID positive that don't meet the criteria for screening? There's really no way to know that answer. I know we, when we talked yesterday about the number of people that are in hospitals that are under investigation, it usually runs at the major hospital systems in Omaha and Lincoln, about 10 to 20 of those types of people per day. But somebody in a hospital setting would be getting tested. They, they, are being, they are getting tested, it's just the results aren't known yet. The question is again, is if you're, if you're out in the public and you don't have symptoms, there's really no way to know whether you have COVID. Or, Still don't, know the, still don't know that answer yet, but if you have symptoms, like the governor's been saying over and over, you know, you should self-quarantine yourself. We have a question from Trump Lewis. He wants to know if the American Red Cross is screened for COVID-19 for their blood drives. Can I step in and take this one, Gary, since I just got my blood drawn? <laughs> so, just got my blood drawn this afternoon, and yes, they are, while they're not uh, doing a test, they are taking your temperature, which again is kind of the first indicator if you've got coronavirus, high fever or fever at all is one of the indications. So yes, they are doing the screening. They took my temperature, asked me if I had been sick. Uh, in fact, they did that, took my temperature multiple times and asked me if I was sick multiple times. So yes, the American Red Cross is doing that screening with regard to it. And then just, uh, again, I just want to kind of comment, Martha, again on your question about testing. So yeah, it's absolutely possible that uh, if you are one of those people who doesn't fit the criteria to get a coronavirus test at this point, and you've got that high fever and that virus, you could be home uh, and you maybe have it, but we just don't know how many of those people are, have the regular flu versus have coronavirus. So you're absolutely right, we just don't know. Yeah. Yeah, so when we, did the, when we do the waivers on some of those requirements to be able to expand the number of healthcare workers, uh, the question was, does that you know, raise concerns about the level of care? And I think it gets back to what we were talking about earlier, for example, with nurse aides. Uh, while they may only have to have eight hours of uh, you know, 
of that education before they can be working in the facility versus the 76, they still have to be competent to provide it. And that's really what we're talking about here. So they will still be competent. They just won't have all the training. It might, might require some increased supervision and that sort of thing. And that's really up to the folks who are employing those people to make sure that the people there can provide that adequate care. But this is, again, trying to make sure that those facilities can be staffed. The alternative is not to have anybody, and that's an even worse outcome, right? So this is really, again, they have to be competent. That's part of the regulations. Uh, it's just loosening up some of the requirements so that we can get those people in and make sure they're getting the training faster. Well, we haven't had, I don't think, any facilities per se. Uh, the question was, did, that, did we write these executive orders because we saw a specific need or a specific facility that was having trouble with staffing? I think, as Heath mentioned, just in general, before the coronavirus, we were about 8 percent sh short on people. Uh, so broadly speaking, there was already a demand for more people than we had to staff. But this was really getting ready to be able to surge up as the virus continues to grow in our state. So again, if you look at some of the models like healthcaredata.org, uh, um, that model from the federal government shows that sometime between mid and late April, the coronavirus will peak in Nebraska. Well, we're, part of our overall strategy is to get more PPE, get more testing, and then create more healthcare facility space. You know, whether that's going to be the actual physical space, whether it's going to be things like ventilators, whether it's going to be things like more staffing and more PPE, all those things go into our capacity for health care. And so our executive order specifically that we did yesterday around licensing and today around facilities is all about expanding the capacity to be able to meet a potential need later this month. So Joanne Young uh, from the Journal Star asks, uh, the respiratory panel can be expensive. Uh, how much was she saying? $2,000. $2,000. I don't think that's accurate, but it can, I think, run about $400 for that panel. And that's one of the reasons why Dr. Antone was talking about loosening those restrictions so that if somebody, say, for example, uh, doesn't have insurance and the health care provider wants to use their discretion, they've <laughs> tested them for flu and they don't have flu, yet they may be one of those high-risk categories. That's where Dr. Antone will work with the uh, public health officials to get that person tested, even without doing that respiratory panel. Martha. Um, on the, the waiver for the, for the AIDS, is this a situation where they can start work with eight hours of training and then have to get the rest of the training, or uh, and, and can they continue working even after uh, this emergency order expires? So, yeah, so the Right, so the question, let's just take the nurse aid moment since we've been talking about that, and he, I'm going to ask you to jump in if I go over astray anywhere. Okay. Uh, the eight hours of training before, and you must be, again, you've got to be competent to provide the service, so don't forget about that. Uh, is the waiver to allow them to get to work faster versus the 76 hours? That only applies during the emergency. So I think it actually the executive order is written so that it apply, it, that will end 30 days after the emergency is taken off. So that will only be a temporary thing that once the emergency is over and the executive orders expire, that person will have to go back to the same sort of requirements that they had before. The same sort of statutes will be in place. Again, these executive orders waive statutes for a limited period of time. Once that period of time is over, then the person will have to go back to comply with the statutes. So, Heath, did I jump in? Right on the money. We'd All right. love to okay. have them stay in the career. Yeah, we'd love to have them stay there. They'll have lots of great experience and training, but they will have to still qualify to uh, get qualified to be a permanent person. Well, okay, so, and I'm going to, Keith, you're going to jump me in if I go wrong. So, again, they have to do the eight hours of training, uh, and they can work during this emergency. I believe during the emergency, they will actually get hours that count toward that 76, right? So, they won't have to go re back and redo the 76. If they get to 76 hours of that training, then they can, then they will be able to continue forward. If they're short of the 76, then yes, they would have to stop working and go back and get the rest of the 76 hours before they'd be eligible to keep moving forward. Is that accurate? Seems right on. The competency right. will absolutely be a part of that, making yep. sure, yeah. And again, it gets back to that competency thing. Yeah, Fred. Uh, the numbers, you said you relaxed the numbers of people that can be in hospitals. Uh, can you give an example of what it was? 
Sure, there's, uh, and, and I might call Dr. Anton up here to give some more specifics, but generally uh, hospitals, uh, for example, critical care hospitals are limited to 25 beds. So we're waiving that requirement so they can have more than 25 beds. There was also a 96 hour uh, average stay or something like that. We're waiving that for surgical ambulatory clinics. Uh, right, yeah, the I think we got 65 critical access hospitals. Yeah. So we, yeah, so we get. So no, we're just waiving the limits to be able, and obviously they still have to have the space, but even other hospitals that want to create, say, uh, rehabilitation beds, we're waiving the requirements for them on that so that they can expand those more easily as well. So again, the idea is to be able to allow hospitals to be able to expand their capacity, uh, waiving the requirements for now during this emergency. When the emergency is over, they'll have to go back to those same requirements they had before. Two more questions. So the question was, bar owners in Omaha are looking at that April 30th deadline as saying, hey, this is when I'll be able to at least start letting some customers back in. Uh, the DHM will have been in effect in Omaha for roughly six weeks at that point. We will reevaluate as we get closer to April 30th to see whether or not we need to extend that further or if we may be able to start loosening some of the restrictions. What I can tell you is that there will not be no restrictions. That's a double negative, I know that's bad English. But the point being is that there will still be restrictions April, after April 30th. I don't know what those restrictions will be. They may be no customers in your bar and still doing package carry out. It may be some limited number of customers in your bar, but there will be a limit. Uh, but we're gonna judge that based upon consultation with, again, the folks we're working with at UNMC, consultation with Dr. Adipur at the Douglas County Health Department, so we're going to make this a collaborative process as we get closer to the end of April to know more about what the data is saying and what, where we want to do with regard to what level of restrictions we want having going forward May 1st and on. All right, Martha, you've asked a lot of questions. I'm going to give somebody else the last chance, and then I'm going to go to Martha. Okay, Martha, you got the last one. So yeah, so the, we are absolutely working. Uh, we can do roughly a, about 1,000 tests a day right now between the public health lab and UNMC and what we're seeing at like CHI. Plus we have, I think, doctor, we're getting about 200 tests now back from the private labs. The commercial labs, the commercial labs I should say, the commercial labs. So we are seeing more tests, but we are absolutely looking to expand that, whether it's buying additional machines, which you can imagine are going to be on back order and it's gonna take a while to get, uh, whether it's, um, other opportunities working with the federal government to be able to expand that. So yes, absolutely, we are looking to be able to expand that testing. I've talked to, you know, I, I mentioned, I think already talking to Tom Poland, the CEO of BD, that they've got a testing regime in place. Uh, the president has talked about one through Abbott Laboratories that would allow us to expand. So there's a number of different channels we're looking at to be able to do that. We certainly want to be able to extend, expand the testing more because we know that's something that people are gonna to wanna to do, but at the moment we are gonna be focusing again on those high priority cases with regard to high risk or your uh, you know, EMT, law enforcement, firefighter, correctional worker, healthcare worker, long-term care resident. Those are gonna be kind of our, our immediate long-term expansions. Well again, folks, thank you very much. Appreciate you all taking the time this afternoon to be here for our coronavirus update. We will come back again tomorrow at two o'clock to give you further updates. But again, just remind everybody, please continue practicing those social distancing guidelines. They are so important. Every Nebraskan can be a part of this battle to fight the coronavirus by taking these steps like washing your hands and staying home when you've got that fever and cough. Those are the things that are gonna be very vital for us to make sure we slow this down and not overwhelm our healthcare facilities. So far, Nebraskans by and large have been doing a great job. Thank you so much to everybody who's been working to help slow the spread of virus here in the state. It's going to be a long month of April. We've got a lot of work left ahead of us. But I know working together, we will beat this thing, as Nebraskans always do, by sticking together. Thanks again, and we'll see you tomorrow.